Today I'm going to talk about the Bergman kernel. This is a really cool object at the intersection of basic functional analysis and basic complex analysis. Okay, so to start, let us pick a domain in a C to the N. Now, if you don't know anything about complex analysis in C to the N, you just understand one variable complex analysis. You can just take N equals one here. You're still going to learn a lot from this video. All right, so the space that we're going to uh, try to understand here is the space H2 omega, which is the space of square integrable holomorphic functions on omega. So I want the functions to be holomorphic, but also I want a bound of this type to hold. So when I integrate against a Lebesgue measure, uh, the absolute value squared of my holomorphic function, I want the integral to be finite. Okay, so it's pretty clear that H2 is a linear subspace of L2 omega, so the space of measurable uh, L2 integrable functions, but it's not clear if it's a Hilbert space. So let me quickly confirm that in the next lemma. So let's quickly confirm that H2 omega is indeed a Hilbert space. So as I said, uh, h2 omega is easily seen to be a vector space so we just need to ag agree on h2 omega also being closed right so more concretely if i take a cauchy sequence inside of h2 omega its limit not only does it sit in l2 of omega but it has to also sit inside h2 omega as well so the l2 limit of holomorphic functions needs to be holomorphic as well not just measurable okay so for that we need to understand an estimate that is uh, of we'll, we'll have interest later on as well so pick your favorite l2 integrable holomorphic function on omega and why not pick a compact subset inside of omega so this means that you can define delta to be the distance between k and an omega and this is always a positive number okay so f being holomorphic means that if you pick a number z inside of k, right, then f of z can be written as the average of the values of f on the whole ball uh, centered at z uh, with diameter delta, right? So delta being the distance between k and the boundary of omega, this integral makes perfect sense. Okay, so let's take absolute values of this identity, right? I'm doing that here in this line. The absolute value goes inside the integral, right? You're going to majorize on the right-hand side, right? So you end up here on this line. So now next what you do, next you apply a Jensen inequality. So a Jensen inequality here or a Cauchy-Schwarz, that's perfectly fine as well. It's the same thing in this case. So then you end up with this line, right? This line, basically you're replacing the L1 integral of the absolute value of F with the L2 integral on, but this is just on the ball, right? Of center Z radius delta. Of course, what you can do, you can increase uh, the small ball to the whole domain and then you will have this inequality, right? So that F of Z here, is going to be dominated by a constant uh, dependent on uh, delta, right, times the L2 integral of f on the whole omega, right? So since z was arbitrary in k, we actually end up with this very, very useful inequality so that the sup norm, right, so this is actually, right, the L infinity norm of f on k, is always bounded from above by a constant depending on k times the L2 integral of f on omega. But what does this really mean? This means that if I have a L2 convergent Cauchy sequence uh, of holomorphic functions, then the L2 convergence will imply uniform convergence on k. 
right? So in particular, the limit has to be also closed, right? So the uniform limit of holomorphic functions is holomorphic. So we got what we immediately, we immediately get what we wanted to show that H2 omega is actually L2 closed. Okay, good. So we have this nice Hilbert space of L2 integrable holomorphic functions. What can we do with it? Well, it turns out that there are a very basic family of natural functionals, right? So pick a point Z in omega and let's take a look at the evaluation functional, right? So let's call this FZ, right? So for every holomorphic function, I get a value. What's the value? It's the value of the function evaluated at Z. Okay, so I'm claiming that this is a continuous functional on H2 omega. Well, why is that? Well, we actually already proved that. Right, so it is this inequality here. F of z is always bounded from above by a fixed constant times the L2 norm of f. So we have a family of continuous functions, functionals on H2 omega, distinguished family, uh, parameterized by all the points uh, of my domain. Okay, so we're in a Hilbert space. Every uh, functional can be written as inner product with a point function, in this case, of your Hilbert space, right? So this is the rees fischer theorem. So there exists for every z, right? So let's fix this z. There exists a, let's call it kz, uh, and then a running variable here in the second argument. So kz, a, there exists a holomorphic for L2 integrable function such that uh, fz ff, Okay, so here's a typo, right? So what I went to write is equal to uh, the L2 integral. Let's say we're integrating psi of kz psi and d nu psi. Okay, so this is how you define the Bergman kernel, right? So the, the function, right, kz psi, right, which has two arguments, right? Z and psi both are... Uh, variables in omega, complex valued is nothing but the Bergman kernel of omega. Okay, so what does this Bergman kernel do? Well, it reproduces the values of holomorphic functions, right? So for fixed z, if you take the inner product of a holomorphic function with kz psi, right, then you get back the value of f of z. Okay, so Nice cool thing, but you really want to get your hand on the Bergman kernel. So this gets us to the next question. Uh, and the last question that we'll investigate in the short video, can the Bergman kernel be understood concretely? Well, it depends how concrete you want to go, but certainly the answer is, well, for the most part, yes, if you are willing to live with a choice of orthonormal Hilbert bases. Okay, what do I mean? So let Let's take a look at our space H2 omega, right? So this is a separable Hilbert space since L2 of omega was already a separable Hilbert space and this is a subspace of it. So this means you can pick a countable ultranormal Hilbert basis. So let's fix such a Hilbert basis. So the next theorem says, believe it or not, that the Bergman kernel we just introduced can be written as this sum here. So let's understand what's on the right hand side. Right? So I take phi j z bar times phi j psi, right? And I'm taking an infinite sum, j running from uh, 1 to infinity. Okay, so I'm claiming that for each fixed z, so fixed z, this sum is going to be in L2 omega psi. Uh, even better, let me put here L2 omega xi, sorry, h2. So what this really means here, it's very simple. So on the right-hand side, uh, so the part of the theorem is to understand what the right-hand side means. So it simply means that for each fixed z, this sum here is going to be convergent in L2 with respect to xi, right? So automatically, since each summons, each summoned is an L2 holomorphic function, Right, the whole sum will be also an L2 holomorphic function if the sum just lands in L2. 
Okay, good. So let's try to understand this. So uh, first, let's try to convince ourselves that this formula here that I just written down on the right hand side actually does what it's supposed to do. So uh, let us give ourselves a little uh, sort of confidence in advance and let's assume that the right hand side is convergent in L2 as uh, proposed. So the question is, okay, so now the right hand side makes sense. Does, does it do what the Bergman kernel does? So let's pick a holomorphic function, L2 integral in omega, and let's see what the right hand side here will do to it. So let's take the integral uh, of f xi, and so let's take the inner product of f with this right hand side here. So we will end up with this expression here, right? So what, what's going on here, right? So uh, we're assuming that this sum is convergent with, resp with respect to xi in L2, right? So that means that the sum sign can come outside the integral, right? So then this happens, right? So only, we only took the sum sign outside the integral. Okay, so now we are looking at what's inside this integral here. Well, what's that? That is just the inner product of f with phi j, right? So with my Hilbert basis, that's right here. And then I'm multiplying that with phi j z. Oh, but what is this? This is actually the Hilbert basis representation of f, right? At the value z, and that's what I wanted to see, right? So if we can assume that this right-hand side here, actually this sum makes sense in L2, it converges in L2, then it has to equal the Bergman kernel, right, by the uniqueness uh, of uh, the uniqueness part of the Ries Fisher theorem. Okay, so let's argue in the remaining part that the sum, this sum, this sum here is actually L2 convergent in xi for any fixed z. Okay, so for that we need to do a quick side estimate. So let's uh, work with this fixed z and let's try to estimate phi j z squared the whole thing sum to n, n to the one half. So this is just what the L2 norm, the small L2 norm of the sequence phi j z, right? So this sequence here. Okay, since this is an L2 norm, right? Again, basic functional analysis here tells you what? Well, you can compute the norm as this kind of supremum, right? So another consequence of the Ries Fisher theorem, right? So you take all L2, small L2 sequences with norm one, and you take the inner product of such a sequence with phi, the sequence of the phi JZs, and you take the supremum. Okay, but what is this? Well, what's inside such a sum? Right, so the AJ is a small L2 sequence, phi J is a Hilbert basis for H2, so this is always where? This is always in H2 of omega. Moreover, since the AJs have, have a, a small L2 norm 1, we get that this supremum is actually what? It's the supremum of all holomorphic functions that are L2 integrable with L2 norm equal to 1, and I am just taking the supremum of the values of set holomorphic function at the value z. Okay, but what have we learned here in this estimate? Let me just roll back quickly at the very beginning, right? So, so this, the value of an L2 integrable holomorphic function is always dominated by uh, its L2 integral here. So that means, it simply means that here, right, since f, uh, I'm just looking at uh, holomorphic functions f with L2 integral equal to 1, this quantity here is always bounded from above. Okay, so in a nutshell, I have argued that for each fixed z, phi jz, the sequence phi jz, when I let j run, is always in small l2. Oh, but then let's look at this summand that we're analyzing, right? So let's call this uh, 
f z xi, right? And we want to understand, is this xi convergent in L2? Well, what have I just proved? That these coefficients, these coefficients here, are always, give always a sequence in small L2. Well, then automatically, right, since the phi j give us a Hilbert basis, right, then automatically this function, capital F, when I let the xi run, is always has to be in L2, right? But that is exactly what I wanted to show, right? So we are basically done. All right, so a couple of things that one needs to mention, right? So uh, first of all, right, so given the, the form of the Bergman kernel, right, so it was phi j z bar phi j xi, right, you automatically get this nice formula, right, that when you take the conjugate of the Bergman kernel, it's equal to the Bergman kernel with the variables flipped. Another thing that's really cool here, so obviously when we defined the Bergman kernel, we didn't, uh, it was independent of any choice of orthonormal Hibbert bases. So in particular, we get what? That this expression here, so even though it concretely depends the expression itself on an orthonormal Hilbert basis, the formula you get will not be dependent on the choice of Hilbert basis. Now, what I will try to do in the next video is, so as you know, right, so for certain domains, one has really good understanding of what uh, uh, Hilbert basis one can pick, right? So for example, on a ball, right? So on a ball, there's a very nice Fourier basis uh, that one can pick. So we'll compute in the next video what uh, the Fourier basis will give you uh, in terms of the Bergman kernel of the ball. All right, good. Thank you for your attention and bye.